Well, God bless you. You know, we kind of have an unspoken, informal um, dress caste system among the staff. You picked up on that? Pastor Weaver, always in a suit and tie on Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And I think he should because he's older. <laughs> I think it's only appropriate. Uh, he, uh, he's 65 and I'm 70, but he's older than I am. And uh, I think he should always have a suit and tie on. And then we kind of got down in the middle bracket, the middle-aged guys like Pastor Brian. He, he wears a suit and, and no tie. And so I, I'm about his age, so I, uh, I thought I would take my cues from him and, and do that tonight. Then we have the young guys, Pastor, younger guys, Pastor Austin. And he wears a sport coat and jeans quite a bit. And, and then we have Pastor Zach and Pastor Luke. I, I've got to get me some of those skinny jeans. <laughs> as soon as I get skinny. <laughs> so it probably won't be happening very soon. Come as you are, amen? We're so glad you are here tonight. My goodness, I, I must be doing something wrong. Pastor Jeff found $40, then he found $100. Pastor Brett has two holes in one. What am I doing wrong here? What am I missing? Do you ever feel that way? <laughs> Pretty amazing. I did find a penny the other day. I did. Honestly, I, I found a penny. I just left it there. I didn't even pick it up. And I, now I'm troubled by that. Uh, I'm wondering what kind of message is in that. Forty dollars, a hundred, and a penny. All right. Well, doesn't the church look beautiful? Uh, oh my goodness, it looks absolutely gorgeous. I want to thank Jan Huff and uh, all of her crew that helped. Uh, countless hours put into decoration and. Uh, the big picture and the little picture, it all looks beautiful. Thank you for your hard work. Appreciate it so very much. I'd like to take a moment before we uh, start tonight and just take uh, a, f a few moments together and pray for Cap Ridgeway. Cap is uh, in a battle. He's fighting cancer. He's not feeling well. Uh, last couple of weeks, a decided difference in his, in his uh, sense of well-being. So I, wanna, I want us to pray for Cap. Uh, Sandy is, is here, I see tonight, so glad you're here. Please tell him we're praying for him and that we love him and we're supporting him every day with our prayers. Our Father, we want to thank you today that you're not far removed from any one of us. You never are. We're thankful, Lord, for the mystery and the mystique of the Christian life. In you we live, we move, we have our being. And we pray tonight for Cap. We just bring him before your throne of grace. And we pray, Lord, that the mighty hand of God uh, would be manifest in power and grace in his life. Touch him. We pray, Lord, for healing. We're thankful that all things are possible with you. Nothing is impossible with God. You're the great physician. You're the creator, God. You're the healer. And I ask you tonight to speak that word over him, and I pray for healing in his body, in his mind, and in his spirit. Lord, when you were through ministering to people, you gave them potential and the command to go in peace and to go in wholeness. And we pray that peace and wholeness will be his tonight. We ask these things in the wonderful name of our Savior, and everyone said, Amen, Amen. Well, I used to approach Christmas with this romantic idealism. Uh, embarrassingly, I admit it was much like that hapless Chevy Chase in Christmas Vacation. I mean, I wanted everything to be perfect, the lights, the perfect tree with presents piled high under the tree, many of them with my name on it. And you say, well, that's understandable. That's the way kids think. But no, this is just a few years ago, actually. <laughs> and as soon as Christmas was over, 
And I don't know if anyone can relate to this, but I would feel this huge letdown. I would feel empty and sad, like it just all went by and I missed it, or it missed me. I had bought into the secular version of the, what Christmas should be, and reality just couldn't keep up with fantasy. It took me a while. I smartened up a little bit. I lowered my expectations. And most importantly, I changed my priorities. And Christmas is sweeter and it's simpler because it's more spiritual now. Commercialism has been replaced with Christ. The work and the weariness of the season with the wonder and the worship of the Savior. The gift who died on the tree, has replaced the gifts under the tree. Well, tonight I'm supposed to talk about materialism, but what I really want to talk about, I think, goes a little deeper and comes before materialism, maybe cause and effect, materialism being the effect. I want to talk tonight about a mindset, better yet, a heart set that conquers materialism. I want to talk about the believer's call to contentment. Let's read about it in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. The Apostle Paul says, we're just reading three verses here. Let's see, 10, 11, 12, 13. No, it's actually four verses, isn't it? Uh, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last... You have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Note a couple of phrases there, verse 11, verse 12. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Recently, my wife uh, told me while she was on a walk, she saw two geese flying overhead, and she said one of them was just loudly squawking over and over. I uh, offered my wisdom on the subject, which was only imaginary. I said, well, it, it was probably calling for other geese to come and join them so that they could all get together and do whatever geese do when they get together. Her theory was that well, it was a husband and a wife. And I said, yeah, and I bet I know which one was squawking. We have conversations like that quite often. But we all do a pretty good job of this squawking business, don't we? Squawking, carping, complaining. Some call it belly aching and, and, and other things. Intellectually, we know we can do better and should do better, but morally and spiritually, we are weak and we succumb to the all too easy routine of counting our burdens instead of our blessings. We find it so difficult, don't we, to comply with Paul's admonition back in chapter 2 and verse 14, where he said, do everything without complaining. Hmm. Now, I've checked my resources. I've scoured commentaries. I've conducted word studies. I've investigated Greek lexicons. And what that really means is, do everything without complaining. It's exactly what, actually, I didn't do any of that stuff, but it sure sounded good, didn't it? I find three truths here that raise my level of contentment, that really help me with my contentment deficiency. 
that I think bring my level of contentment up a little bit, a little closer to that of the apostles. I doubt if I'll ever be there, but moving in the right direction is important. First of all, the first inspiration I find in our text are these words of contentment. Now, some people have an interesting notion of the Apostle Paul. They see him as a man that was very stern and rigid and harsh and unyielding, and and some have painted him even unforgiving. But there are several words and key phrases in this short text that I think are very revealing about Paul. Paul, I love that man. He's my main man. He's my go-to guy, my mentor, my teacher my example. And I relish those times when Paul opens his heart and he lets us in. And he lets us in on what he's thinking, what he's feeling, what he's going through, and how he's going about processing life. It reminds us that he's human after all. And if he's human, he writes from a perspective that I can understand, that I can relate to. Human to human, man to man, believer to believer. I feel a kinship with Paul when I read these words. I I feel a hand on my shoulder and a whisper in my ear and a nod of encouragement in my direction. First of all, note that there are words of joy here in verse 10. He said, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Paul was an apostle of joy. No one in the Bible wrote more about joy than Paul did. The words joy and rejoice are found over a dozen times in this epistle alone. He speaks of his joy and their joy and his rejoicing with them. Somebody told Paul the fruit of the Spirit is joy. In fact, he's the one who wrote those words. And Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, gave those words to you and me. You can't tell me that Paul was not a man of joy. I suspect, in fact, that he was one of the most joyous people on the planet. And that if you and I had had the privilege of meeting Paul, we would have been overwhelmed by the joy factor in this man's life. And if you're a Christian, you don't have joy, you owe somebody. In fact, you owe everybody an apology. If you're a Christian, you don't have joy, you owe everybody an apology, get busy. The night is still young. You can start right now. If you're a Christian and you don't have joy, what part of saved do you not understand? What impediment stifles your joy? What roadblocks keep, keep you out of joyville? What lack deprives you of the joy of the Lord? Now look at Paul. Paul is in a Roman prison, separated from loved ones, sa- silenced from preaching the gospel. And he says, I rejoice greatly. And if he can do that under those circumstances, you and I. Can we not rejoice at least a little? There's another word used in connection with Paul's joy and his contentment, and that is the word learned. I hope you've noticed that in our text in verse 11 and in verse 12. I've learned to be content. Whatever, whatever the circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. And it's interesting to me that the the two times that Paul references his contentment, he also indicates it was something he had learned. So don't lose heart. It's a journey. It's a process. It's something we learn. It has a learning curve to it. I'm a slow learner. When it comes to learning, I'm a crock pot, not a microwave. I did say crock pot, not cracked pot. But maybe my crock pot is a crack pot. I haven't checked lately. I've never been a quick study. 
takes a lot of time and effort and patience to get through to me. <laughs> Carolyn and God have been working on me for decades, and this is what they got. I'm so glad God is amazingly patient, and Carolyn is too. So how do you learn to be content? Well, like most things in the Christian life, I think maybe you've noticed, there are no formulas. Everyone has to learn in their own way because everybody's an individual. Learning is as individual as we are. And every one of us brings a unique background and skill set and giftings and history and circumstances and heart and mind and spirit. There are no clones, no duplicates, no robots in the kingdom, just people, just people. Each one different than everyone else. Contentment ought to be our goal. Learning is the way to get there. No shortcuts. No, sorry. No free passes. No miracles, just the hard way. Learning the hard way. Contentment, getting there the hard way, learning. So you keep showing up for class. You, you listen, you observe, you take notes, you study, you face some tests, you pass some, you don't do some good on some others. But you stay with it and you learn. Uh, contentment, by the way, is not laziness. It's not a cop-out. It doesn't mean there's a lack of initiative or drive or ambition. Uh, Paul is not resting on his laurels. Paul is not resigning to resigning. In fact, look what he says in the previous chapter, chapter 3, verse 12. I love these words. He said, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on. It's the word from which we get, the Greek word is the word from which we get our English word, agonize. I agonize on. I press on. It's terminology used of the athlete who is focused, every part of him, focused on the objective. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, that athletic terminology again, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Yes, I, I've learned, but I haven't learned everything. I've learned, but I'm still learning. Paul speaks words of contentment here. And then he has words of containment. Now, you might think, well, these words are easy for Paul. After all, <laughs> he's an apostle. You know, apostles are just different. They have different DNA. Some of you feel that way about pastors. And I would think you would have seen our humanity enough by now to be disabused of such a notion that we are made out of anything differently than you are. We're made out of the same dirt, the same mud pie as you. But some people think, well, apostles, you know, I mean, after all, look, look at the... Look at the scope of their ministry. Look at how the miracles flowed from them. They strike people blind like Paul did and make blind eyes open like Paul did. They cast out evil spirits like Paul did. They heal the sick and raise the dead like Paul did. They have a blessed life. They never suffer any want. Oh, really? If you believe that, I'm afraid you don't know the Apostle Paul, and I'm sorry, you don't know your Bible very well either. In verse 12, Paul talks about this two-sided coin of life. Talks about the good times and the bad and the 
prosperity and poverty and peace and pain and feasting and fasting. In verse 12, that's why he said, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And in chapter 1, he references his, his chains three times. His life as an apostle of Christ gave him the full gamut of human experience. His circumstances changed, and they could change in a moment. He could go from being blessed to being beaten, from ministry to mobs, from sermons to stones, from preaching to prison, and even here, he writes from prison, and he's writing to the church in Philippi. And oh, what a history he and Philippi had. When he was there, a church was started through the conversion of a businesswoman. A demon was cast out of another woman, followed by Oh, you know, apostolic stuff, mobs, beatings, prison. Just another day in the office for an apostle. And in that prison in Philippi at the midnight hour, Paul and Silas sang praises to God. I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. Admittedly, Paul was never in the state of West Virginia, so I don't know if that would apply there or not. His circumstances changed, but his, commit, his contentment didn't. Whatever came, Paul was content. He makes that so clear. You know, young people, a few years ago, I don't know if they still do it, they used to roll their eyes a lot and say, whatever well, Paul says whatever quite a bit himself. Chapter 4, verse 11, I have learned to be content. Whatever the circumstances. Chapter 1, verse 12, whatever has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Chapter 1, verse 27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Paul is saying, look, Jesus is present in every situation, Jesus presides over every situation. Jesus is Lord over whatever. There's no whatever beyond the scope of his knowledge. There's no whatever that defies his power to use for his glory. There's no whatever that he cannot ordain for his holy purposes. You say, well, what about me? Man, I'm in trouble here. I am in trouble. Well, Paul was in trouble too. That's the word he used. In fact, he writes, as he writes, he references tr his troubles. In chapter 1, verse 17, he speaks of those who can stir up trouble for him. And in chapter 4, verse 14, he says, it was good of you to share in my troubles. I know troubles. Trouble was a way of life for him. And if you're having troubles... You're in good company. And the same God who came to the aid and assistance of Paul will come to you with his multifaceted and all-sufficient grace. Somebody say amen. amen. For the Christian, contentment is independent of circumstances. At least that's our potential through Christ. So Paul talks about words of contentment, words of containment, but then he talks about words of confidence in verse 13. Look what he says. The NIV says it this way, I can do everything. The King James says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now I want you to look what he didn't say, okay? Okay. Paul's a very competent man. He's a man of extreme intelligence, a man widely traveled. He had the best education. 
He was a teacher, a theologian, a writer, an historian, a leader in every way. But Paul did not say, I can do all things. If he had said that, it would have been the words of an, abs an, an absurdly, insanely delusional man. I can do all things, put you out of touch with reality and qualifies you for the Dr. Phil show. I can do all things is, is humanism. Man is the answer. Man is God. Now, I've met some people in life that were incredibly bright and sophisticated and multi-talented, and they could do so many things well. They are ten-talent people, and I'm so jealous of them. I, own, I have one maybe on a good day, but it's got to be a, a really good day. But even those ten-talent people can't say, I can do all things. We tell our children, you can be anything you want. You can do anything. You can go anywhere. Well, just between you and me, <laughs> that's not true. They can't. We're all born with limitations. That doesn't mean we can't excel. That doesn't mean we can't go out there and do extraordinary things. But no one can say, I can do all things. Not even Paul. Here's what he did say. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus is so real to me that the power of his presence will enable me to do everything he asks me to do. I can wear these chains like a bracelet of honor for his glory. I can endure this prison because he gives me a freedom no man can take away from me. I can sing at the midnight hours because Christ is with me. I can take the martyr's walk with my head held high because I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him. He gives me strength. Strength I don't have, strength I didn't know I could have. Through Him. Who? Him. Who's Him? Well, in verse 4, verse 5, verse 10, it's the Lord. Verse 6, verse 7, it's God. Verse 7, it's Christ Jesus. Verse 9, it's the God of peace. He's working for me. Verse 19, my God, Christ Jesus. Verse 20, our God and Father. Verse 23, the Lord Jesus Christ. Context, the cultural context in which Paul wrote this is truly amazing. Paul lived and he ministered in the Roman Empire. Caesar was worshiped as Lord. His divinity was declared on the coins the people would say, Caesar is Lord, but not Paul. Paul never said that. Paul lived saying, Jesus is Lord. Everywhere he went, it was Jesus is Lord. He died saying, Jesus is Lord. In fact, that's why he died. This epistle was written somewhere around 62 or 63 A.D., and in less than five years, Paul will be re-imprisoned, and Nero will execute both Simon Peter and the Apostle Paul. Peter, by crucifixion, Paul will be beheaded. On that last walk, I see him walking with his hands bound behind him, He's old now. His battered body shows all the signs of prison and persecution. But I see him smiling, an uncanny smile. He's smiling because he knows too much not to smile. I see his lips moving. 
And I hear him saying to himself and to those around him, Jesus is Lord. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Do you need a strength today to do what you can't do and to be what you can't be? Do you need a strength today to answer the call to a contented life? Let's pray. Our worship team is going to come. We look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you that in our weakness your strength is manifest. I thank you, Lord, you don't need us to pull this off. You you just need us to get out of the way and let you be the Lord of our lives. And I pray, Lord, that you'll give us the insight and the perception and the wisdom to unanimously vote down the call of this world the foolishness of this age that we will remember every day and every hour of every day that we walk to a different tune. We don't sing the songs of the world. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord in life. He's Lord in death. He's Lord in every holiday. He's Lord in every day. Jesus is Lord, whether we have plenty or whether we want. Jesus is Lord, whether we're in prison or whether we're free. Jesus is Lord, whether we're sick or well. Jesus, be the Lord of all. Be the Lord of all of our lives. You're not far removed from us, no. You're here to impart, to bless, to give strength, to make us strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We want you to know that the altar is always open. If you have some unfinished business to take care of, just come and let the Lord touch you. Let Him minister to you. Let Him confirm His Word and His will in your heart. The song speaks about standing. That's what we have to do. Stand. Having done all, Paul says, stand. God will stand with you. He'll give you the grace that you need to stand strong and to stand tall in this world. Let's thank him for that. Father, we thank you tonight for the grace. That multi-faceted grace of God that comes at us just the form that we need and some are facing great struggles personally some are facing them professionally on the job and some are facing them in their and physically in their own bodies but I think that when we leave here tonight we do not leave alone we have a divine accompaniment of grace grace that is sufficient grace that is unsurpassed and I pray that that grace will ever draw us closer to you help us to understand your will for our lives and our walk for you Lord help us not to be conformed to the pattern of this world but to be conformed into the image of your son may your spirit work within us fully freely for the glory of God we pr- everyone said amen amen God bless you have a great week a week of thanksgiving rejoicing a week of learning a week of getting ever closer to contentment we look forward to seeing many of you here Wednesday night God bless you